Chapter Eleven, Part One of The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, by Charles Darwin. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, on the Geological Succession of Organic Beings, on the slow and successive appearance of new species, on their different rates of change species once lost do not reappear groups of species follow the same general rules in their appearance and disappearance as do single species on extinction on simultaneous changes in the forms of life throughout the world on the affinities of extinct species to each other and to living species on the state of development of ancient forms on the succession of the same types within the same areas summary of preceding and present chapters let us now see whether the several facts and laws relating to the geological succession of organic beings accord best with the common view of the immutability of species or with that of their slow and gradual modification through variation and natural selection new species have appeared very slowly one after another both on the land and in the waters lyell has shown that it is hardly possible to resist the evidence on this head in the case of the several tertiary stages and every year tends to fill up the blanks between the stages and to make the proportion between the lost and existing forms more gradual in some of the most recent beds though undoubtedly of high antiquity if measured by years but only one or two are new having appeared there for the first time either locally or as far as we know on the face of the earth the secondary formations are more broken but as braun has remarked neither the appearance nor disappearance of the many species embedded in each formation has been simultaneous species belonging to different genera and classes have not changed at the same rate or in the same degree in the older tertiary beds a few living shells may still be found in the midst of a multitude of extinct forms falconer has given a striking instance of a similar fact for an existing crocodile is associated with many lost mammals and reptiles in the sub-himalayan deposits the silurian lingula differs but little from the living species of this genus whereas most of the other silurian mollusks and all the crustaceans have changed greatly the productions of the land seem to have changed at a quicker rate than those of the sea of which a striking instance has been observed in switzerland there is some reason to believe that organisms high in the scale change more quickly than those that are low though there are exceptions to this rule the amount of organic change as pictet has remarked is not the same in each successive so-called formation yet if we compare any but the most closely related formations all the species will be found to have undergone some change when a species has once disappeared from the face of the earth we have no reason to believe that the same identical form ever reappears the strongest apparent exception to this latter rule is that of so-called colonies end quote, of m Baron, which intrude for a period in the midst of an older formation and then allow the pre-existing fauna to reappear but lyell's explanation namely that it is a case of temporary migration from a distinct geographical province seems satisfactory these several facts accord well with our theory which includes no fixed law of development causing all the inhabitants of an area to change abruptly or simultaneously or to an equal degree the process of modification must be slow and will generally affect only a few species at the same time for the variability of each species is independent of that of all others whether such variations or individual differences as may arise will be accumulated through natural selection in a greater or less degree thus causing a greater or less amount of permanent modification will depend on many complex contingencies on the variations being of a beneficial nature 
effect on the freedom of intercrossing on the lowly changing physical conditions of the country on the immigration of new colonists and on the nature of the other inhabitants with which the varying species come into competition hence it is by no means surprising that one species should retain the same identical form much longer than others or if changing should change in a less degree we find similar relations between the existing inhabitants of distinct countries for instance the land shells and coleopterous insects of madeira have come to differ considerably from their nearest allies on the continent of europe whereas the marine shells and birds have remained unaltered we can perhaps understand the apparently quicker rate of change in terrestrial and in more highly organized productions compared with marine and lower productions by the more complex relations of the higher beings to their organic and inorganic conditions of life as explained in a former chapter when many of the inhabitants of any area have become modified and improved we can understand on the principle of competition and from the all-important relations of organism to organism in the struggle for life that any form which did not become in some degree modified and improved would be liable to extermination hence we see why all the species in the same region do at last if we look to long enough intervals of time become modified for otherwise they would become extinct and members of the same class the average amount of change during laws and equal periods of time may perhaps be nearly the same but as the accumulation of enduring formations rich in fossils depends on great masses of sediment being deposited on subsiding areas our formations have been almost necessarily accumulated at wide and irregularly intermittent intervals of time consequently the amount of organic change exhibited by the fossils embedded in consecutive formations is not equal each formation on this view does not mark a new and complete act of creation but only an occasional scene taken almost at hazard in an ever slowly changing drama we can clearly understand why a species when once lost should never reappear even if the very same conditions of life organic and inorganic should recur for though the offspring of one species might be adapted and no doubt this has occurred in innumerable instances to fill the place of another species in the economy of nature and thus supplant it yet the two forms the old and the new would not be identically the same for both would almost certainly inherit different characters from their distinct progenitors and organisms already differing would vary in a different manner for instance it is possible if all our fantail pigeons were destroyed that fanciers might make a new breed hardly distinguishable from the present breed but if the parent rock pigeon were likewise destroyed and under nature we have every reason to believe that parent forms are generally supplanted and exterminated by their improved offspring it is incredible that a fanned tail identical with the existing breed could be raised from any other species of pigeon or even from any other well-established race of the domestic pigeon for the successive variations would almost certainly be in some degree different and the newly formed variety would probably inherit from its progenitor some characteristic differences groups of species that is genera and families follow the same general rules in their appearance and disappearance as do single species changing more or less quickly and in a greater or lesser degree a group when it has once disappeared never reappears that is its existence as long as it lasts is continuous i am aware that there are some apparent exceptions to this rule but the exceptions are surprisingly few so few that e forbes pictay and woodward though all strongly opposed to such views as i maintain admit its truth and the rule strictly accords with the theory for all the species of the same group however long it may have lasted are the modified descendants one from the other and all from a common progenitor 
in the genus lingula for instance the species which have successively appeared at all ages must have been connected by an unbroken series of generations from the lowest silurian stratum to the present day we have seen in the last chapter that whole groups of species sometimes falsely appear to have been abruptly developed and i have attempted to give an explanation of this fact which if true would be fatal to my views but such cases are certainly exceptional the general rule being a gradual increase in number until the group reaches its maximum and then sooner or later a gradual decrease if the number of the species included within a genus or the number of the genera within a family be represented by a vertical line of varying thickness ascending through the successive geological formations in which the species are found the line will sometimes falsely appear to begin at its lower end not in a sharp point but abruptly it then gradually thickens upwards often keeping of equal thickness for a space and ultimately thins out in the upper beds marking the decrease and final extinction of the species this gradual increase in number of the species of a group is strictly conformable with the theory for the species of the same genus and the genera of the same family can increase only slowly and progressively the process of modification and the production of a number of allied forms necessarily being a slow and gradual process one species first giving rise to two or three varieties these being slowly converted into species which in their turn produce by equally slow steps other varieties and species and so on like the branching of a great tree from a single stem till the group becomes large on extinction we have as yet only spoken incidentally of the disappearance of species and of groups of species on the theory of natural selection the extinction of old forms and the production of new and improved forms are intimately connected together the old notion of all the inhabitants of the earth having been swept away by catastrophes at successive periods is very generally given up even by those geologists as Allais de beaumont murchison baron etc whose general views would naturally lead them to this conclusion on the contrary we have every reason to believe from the study of the tertiary formations that species and groups of species gradually disappear one after another first from one spot then from another and finally from the world in some few cases however as by the breaking of an isthmus and the consequent eruption of a multitude of new inhabitants into an adjoining area or by the final subsidence of an island the process of extinction may have been rapid both single species and whole groups of species last for very unequal periods some groups as we have seen have endured from the earliest known dawn of life to the present day some have disappeared before the close of the paleozoic period no fixed law seems to determine the length of time during which any single species or any single genus endures there is reason to believe that the extinction of a whole group of species is generally a slower process than their production if their appearance and disappearance be represented as before by a vertical line of varying thickness the line is found to taper more gradually at its upper end which marks the progress of extermination than at its lower end which marks the first appearance and the early increase in number of the species in some cases however the extermination of whole groups as of ammonites toward the close of the secondary period has been wonderfully sudden the extinction of species has been involved in the most gratuitous mystery some authors have even supposed that as the individual has a definite length of life so have species a definite duration no one can have marvelled more than i have done at the extinction of species when i found in la plata 
the tooth of a horse embedded with the remains of mastodon megatherium toxodon and other extinct monsters which all coexisted with still living shells at a very late geological period i was filled with astonishment for seeing that the horse since its introduction by the spaniards into south america has run wild over the whole country and has increased in numbers at an unparalleled rate i asked myself what could so recently have exterminated the former horse under conditions of life apparently so favourable but my astonishment was groundless professor owen soon perceived that the tooth though so like that of the existing horse belonged to an extinct species had this horse been still living but in some degree rare no naturalist would have felt the least surprise at its rarity for rarity is the attribute of a vast number of species of all classes in all countries if we ask ourselves why this or that species is rare we answer that something is unfavourable in its conditions of life but whatever that something is we can hardly ever tell on the supposition of the fossil horse still existing as a rare species we might have felt certain from the analogy of all other mammals even of the slow-breeding elephant and from the history of the naturalization of the domestic horse in south america that under more favourable conditions it would in a very few years have stocked the whole continent but we could not have told what the unfavourable conditions were which checked its increase whether some one or several contingencies and at what period of the horse's life and in what degree they severally acted if the conditions had gone on however slowly becoming less and less favourable we assuredly should not have perceived the fact yet the fossil horse would certainly have become rarer and rarer and finally extinct its place being seized on by some more successful competitor it is most difficult always to remember that the increase of every living creature is constantly being checked by unperceived hostile agencies and that the same unperceived agencies are amply sufficient to cause rarity and finally extinction so little is this subject understood that i have heard surprise repeatedly expressed at such great monsters as the mastodon and the more ancient dinosaurians having become extinct as if mere bodily strength gave victory in the battle of life mere size on the contrary would in some cases determine as has been remarked by owen quicker extermination from the greater amount of requisite food before man inhabited india or africa some cause must have checked the continued increase of the existing elephant a highly capable judge dr falconer believes that it is chiefly insects which from incessantly harassing and weakening the elephant in india check its increase and this was bruce's conclusion with respect to the african elephant in abyssinia it is certain that insects and blood-sucking bats determine the existence of the larger naturalized quadrupeds in several parts of south america we see in many cases in the more recent tertiary formations that rarity precedes extinction and we know that this has been the progress of events with those animals which have been exterminated either locally or wholly through man's agency i may repeat what i published in eighteen forty five namely that to admit that species generally become rare before they become extinct feel no surprise at the rarity of a species and yet to marvel greatly when the species ceases to exist is much the same as to admit that sickness in the individual is the forerunner of death to feel no surprise at sickness but when the man dies to wonder and to suspect that he died by some deed of violence 
the theory of natural selection is grounded on the belief that each new variety and ultimately each new species is produced and maintained by having some advantage over those with which it comes into competition and the consequent extinction of less favoured forms almost inevitably follows it is the same with our domestic productions when a new or slightly improved variety has been raised it at first supplants the less improved varieties in the same neighbourhood when much improved it is transported far and near like our short-horned cattle and takes the place of other breeds in other countries thus the appearance of new forms and the disappearance of old forms both those naturally and artificially produced are bound together in flourishing groups the number of new specific forms which have been produced within a given time has at some periods probably been greater than the number of the old specific forms which have been exterminated but we know that species have not gone on indefinitely increasing at least during the later geological epochs so that looking to later times we may believe that the production of new forms has caused the extinction of about the same number of old forms the competition will generally be most severe as formerly explained and illustrated by examples between the forms which are most like each other in all respects hence the improved and modified descendants of a species will generally cause the extermination of the parent species and if many new forms have been developed from any one species the nearest allies of that species i e the species of the same genus will be the most liable to extermination thus as i believe a number of new species descended from one species that is a new genus comes to supplant an old genus belonging to the same family but it must often have appeared that a new species belonging to some one group has seized on the place occupied by a species belonging to a distinct group and thus have caused its extermination if many allied forms be developed from the successful intruder many will have to yield their places and it will generally be the allied forms which will suffer from some inherited inferiority in common but whether it be species belonging to the same or to a distinct class which have yielded their places to other modified and improved species a few of the sufferers may often be preserved for a long time from being fitted to some peculiar line of life or from inhabiting some distant and isolated station where they will have escaped severe competition for instance some species of trigonia a great genus of shells in the secondary formations survive in the australian seas and a few members of the great and almost extinct group of ganoid fishes still inhabit our fresh waters therefore the utter extinction of a group is generally as we have seen a slower process than its production with respect to the apparently sudden extermination of whole families or orders as of trilobites at the close of the paleozoic period and of ammonites at the close of the secondary period we must remember what has been already said on the probable wide intervals of time between our consecutive formations and in these intervals there may have been much slow extermination moreover when by sudden immigration or by unusually rapid development many species of a new group have taken possession of an area many of the older species will have been exterminated in a correspondingly rapid manner and the forms which thus yield their places will commonly be allied for they will partake of the same inferiority in common thus it seems to me the manner in which single species and whole groups of species become extinct accords well with the theory of natural selection we need not marvel at extinction if we must marvel let it be at our presumption in imagining for a moment that we understand the many complex contingencies on which the existence of each species depends if we forget for an instant that each species tends to increase inordinately and that some check is always in action 
yet seldom perceived by us, the whole economy of nature will be utterly obscured. Whenever we can precisely say why this species is more abundant in individuals than that, why this species and not another can be naturalized in a given country, then, and not until then, we may justly feel surprise why we cannot account for the extinction of any particular species or group of species. On the forms of life changing almost simultaneously throughout the world. Scarcely any paleontological discovery is more striking than the fact that the forms of life change almost simultaneously throughout the world. Thus, our European chalk formation can be recognized in many distant regions under the most different climates, where not a fragment of the mineral chalk itself can be found, namely in North America, in Equatorial South America, in Tierra del Fuego, at the Cape of Good Hope, and in the peninsula of India. For at these distant points, the organic remains in certain beds present an unmistakable resemblance to those of the chalk. It is not that the same species are met with, for in some cases not one species is identically the same, but they belong to the same families, genera, and sections of genera, and sometimes are similarly characterized in such trifling points as mere superficial structure. Moreover, other forms, which are not found in the chalk of Europe, but which occur in the formations either above or below, occur in the same order at these distant points of the world. In the several successive Paleozoic formations of Russia, Western Europe, and North America, a similar parallelism in the forms of life has been observed by several authors, so it is, according to Lyell, with the European and North American tertiary deposits. Even if the few fossil species, which are common to the old and new worlds, were kept wholly out of view, the general parallelism in the successive forms of life in the Paleozoic and tertiary stages would still be manifest, and the several formations could be easily correlated. These observations, however, relate to the marine inhabitants of the world. We have not sufficient data to judge whether the productions of the land and of fresh water at distant points change in the same parallel manner. We may doubt whether they have thus changed. If the Megatherium, Mylodon, Macrauciana, and Toxodon had been brought to Europe from La Plata, without any information in regard to their geological position, no one would have expected that they had coexisted with the seashells all still living. But as these anomalous monsters coexisted with the mastodon and horse, it might at least have been inferred that they had lived during one of the later tertiary stages. When the marine forms of life are spoken of as having changed simultaneously throughout the world, it must not be supposed that this expression relates to the same year, or even to the same century, or even that it has a very strict geological sense. For if all the marine animals now living in Europe, and all those that lived in Europe during the Pleistocene period, a very remote period, as measured by years, including the whole glacial epoch, were compared with those now existing in South America or in Australia, the most skilful naturalist would hardly be able to say whether the present or the pleistocene inhabitants of europe resembled most closely those of the southern hemisphere so again several highly competent observers maintain that the existing productions of the united states are more closely related to those which lived in europe during certain late tertiary stages than to the present inhabitants of europe and if this be so it is evident that fossiliferous beds now deposited on the shores of North America would hereafter be liable to be classed with somewhat older European beds. Nevertheless, looking to a remotely future epoch, there can be little doubt that all the more modern marine formations, namely the Upper Pliocene, the Pleistocene, and strictly modern beds of Europe, North and South America, and Australia, 
from containing fossil remains in some degree allied and from not including those forms which are found only in the older underlying deposits would be correctly ranked as simultaneous in a geological sense the fact of the forms of life changing simultaneously in the above large sense at distant parts of the world has greatly struck those admirable observers m m de vernoul and dirquet after referring to the parallelism of the paleozoic forms of life in various parts of europe they add quote, if struck by this strange sequence we turn our attention to north america and there discover a series of analogous phenomena it will appear certain that all these modifications of species their extinction and the introduction of new ones cannot be owing to mere changes in marine currents or other causes more or less local and temporary but depend on general laws which govern the whole animal kingdom m Boron has made forcible remarks to precisely the same effect it is indeed quite futile to look to changes of currents climate or other physical conditions as the cause of these great mutations in the forms of life throughout the world under the most difficult climates we must as Boron has remarked look to some special law we shall see this more clearly when we treat of the present distribution of organic beings and find how slight is the relation between the physical conditions of various countries and the nature of their inhabitants this great fact of the parallel succession of the forms of life throughout the world is explicable on the theory of natural selection new species are formed by having some advantage over older forms and the forms which are already dominant or have some advantage over the other forms in their own country give birth to the greatest number of new varieties or incipient species we have distinct evidence on this head in the plants which are dominant that is which are commonest and most widely diffused producing the greatest number of new varieties it is also natural that the dominant varying and far-spreading species which have already invaded to a certain extent the territories of other species should be those which would have the best chance of spreading still further and of giving rise in new countries to other new varieties and species the process of diffusion would often be very slow depending on climatal and geographical changes on strange accidents and on the gradual acclimatization of new species to the various climates through which they might have to pass but in the course of time the dominant forms would generally succeed in spreading and would ultimately prevail the diffusion would it is probable be slower with the terrestrial inhabitants of distinct continents than with the marine inhabitants of the continuous sea we might therefore expect to find as we do a less strict degree of parallelism in the succession of the productions of the land than with those of the sea thus it seems to me the parallel and taken in a large sense simultaneous succession of the same forms of life throughout the world accords well with the principle of new species having been formed by dominant species spreading widely and varying the new species thus produced being themselves dominant owing to their having had some advantage over their already dominant parents as well as over other species and again spreading varying and producing new forms the old forms which are beaten and which yield their places to the new and victorious forms will generally be allied in groups from inheriting some inferiority in common and therefore as new and improved groups spread throughout the world old groups disappear from the world and the succession of forms everywhere tends to correspond both in their first appearance and final disappearance there is one other remark connected with this subject worth making 
I have given my reasons for believing that most of our great formations, rich in fossils, were deposited during periods of subsidence, and that blank intervals of vast duration, as far as fossils are concerned, occurred during the periods when the bed of the sea was either stationary or rising, and likewise when sediment was not thrown down quickly enough to embed and preserve organic remains. During these long and blank intervals, I suppose that the inhabitants of each region underwent a considerable amount of modification and extinction, and that there was much migration from other parts of the world, and, likewise, when sediment was not thrown down quickly enough to embed and preserve organic remains. During these long and blank intervals, I suppose that the inhabitants of each region underwent a considerable amount of modification and extinction and that there was much migration from other parts of the world as we have reason to believe that large areas are affected by the same movement it is probable that strictly contemporaneous formations have often been accumulated over very wide spaces in the same quarter of the world but we are very far from having any right to conclude that this has invariably been the case and that large areas have invariably been affected by the same movements when two formations have been deposited in two regions during nearly but not exactly the same period we should find in both from the causes explained in the foregoing paragraphs the same general succession in the forms of life but the species would not exactly correspond, for there will have been a little more time in the one region than in the other for modification, extinction, and immigration. I suspect that cases of this nature occur in Europe. Mr. Prestwich, in his admirable Memoirs on the Eocene Deposits of England and France, is able to draw a close general parallelism between the successive stages in the two countries but when he compares certain stages in england with those in france although he finds in both a curious accordance in the numbers of the species belonging to the same genera yet the species themselves differ in a manner very difficult to account for considering the proximity of the two areas unless indeed it be assumed that an isthmus separated two seas inhabited by distinct but contemporaneous faunas Lyell has made similar observations on some of the later tertiary formations. Baron also shows that there is a striking general parallelism in the successive Silurian deposits of Bohemia and Scandinavia. Nevertheless, he finds a surprising amount of difference in the species. If the several formations in these regions have not been deposited during the same exact periods, a formation in one region often corresponding with a blank interval in the other, and if in both regions the species have gone on slowly changing during the accumulation of the several formations and during the long intervals of time between them, in this case the several formations in the two regions could be arranged in the same order in accordance with the general succession of the forms of life and the order would falsely appear to be strictly parallel nevertheless the species would not all be the same in the apparently corresponding stages in the two regions on the affinities of extinct species to each other and to living forms let us now look to the mutual affinities of extinct and living species all fall into a few grand classes, and this fact is at once explained on the principle of descent. The more ancient any form is, the more, as a general rule, it differs from living forms. But, as Buckland long ago remarked, extinct species can all be classed either in still existing groups or between them. That the extinct forms of life help to fill up the intervals between existing genera, families, and orders is certainly true, but as this statement has often been ignored or even denied, it may be well to make some remarks on this subject and to give some instances. If we confine our attention either to the living or to the extinct species of the same class, 
the series is far less perfect than if we combine both into one general system in the writings of professor owen we continually meet with the expression of generalized forms as applied to extinct animals and in the writings of agassiz of prophetic or synthetic types and these terms imply that such forms are in fact intermediate or connecting links another distinguished paleontologist m gaudry has shown in the most striking manner that many of the fossil mammals discovered by him in attica serve to break down the intervals between existing genera cuvier ranked the ruminants and pachyderms as two of the most distinct orders of mammals but so many fossil links have been disentombed that owen has had to alter the whole classification and has placed certain pachyderms in the same sub-order with ruminants for example he dissolves by gradations the apparently wide interval between the pig and the camel the ungulata or hoofed quadrupeds are now divided into the even-toed or odd-toed divisions but the maucrachinia of south america connects to a certain extent these two grand divisions no one will deny that the hapirian is intermediate between the existing horse and certain other ungulate forms but a wonderful connecting link in the chain of animals is the typothurium from south america as the name given to it by professor gervais expresses and which cannot be placed in any existing order the sirenia form a very distinct group of the mammals and one of the most remarkable peculiarities in existing dugong and lamentin is the entire absence of hind limbs without even a rudiment being left but the extinct halitherium had according to professor flower an ossified thigh bone quote, articulated into a well-defined acetabulum in the pelvis end quote and it thus makes some approach to ordinary hoofed quadrupeds to which the serenia are in other respects allied the cetaceans or whales are widely different from all other mammals but the tertiary zeuglodon and squalodon which have been placed by some naturalists in an order by themselves are considered by professor huxley to be undoubtedly cetaceans Quote, and to constitute connecting links with the aquatic carnivora end quote. even the wide interval between birds and reptiles has been showed by the naturalist just quoted to be partially bridged over in the most unexpected manner on the one hand by the ostrich and extinct archaeopteryx and on the other hand by the comsognathus one of the dinosaurians that group which includes the most gigantic of all terrestrial reptiles turning to the invertebra Barand asserts a higher authority could not be named that he is every day taught that although paleozoic animals can certainly be classed under existing groups yet at this ancient period the groups were not so distinctly separated from each other as they are now some writers have objected to any extinct species or group of species being considered an intermediate between any two living species or groups of species if by this term it is meant that an extinct form is directly intermediate in all its characters between two living forms or groups the objection is probably valid but in a natural classification many fossil species certainly stand between living species and some extinct genera between living genera even between genera belonging to distinct families the most common case especially with respect to very distinct groups such as fish and reptiles seems to be that supposing them to be distinguished at the present day by a score of characters the ancient members are separated by a somewhat lesser number of characters so that the two groups formerly made a somewhat nearer approach to each other than they do now it is a common belief that the more ancient a form is by so much the more it tends to connect 
by some of its characters groups now widely separated from each other this remark no doubt must be restricted to those groups which have undergone much change in the course of geological ages and it would be difficult to prove the truth of the proposition for every now and then even a living animal as the lepidopsiran is discovered having affinities directed towards very distinct groups yet if we compare the older reptiles and petrachians the older fish the older cephalopods and the eocene mammals with the recent members of the same classes we must admit that there is truth in the remark let us see how far these several facts and inferences accord with the theory of descent with modification as the subject is somewhat complex i must request the reader to turn to the diagram in the fourth chapter we may suppose that the numbered letters in italics represent genera and the dotted lines diverging from them the species in each genus the diagram is much too simple too few genera and too few species being given but this is unimportant for us the horizontal lines may represent successive geological formations and all the forms beneath the uppermost line may be considered as extinct the three existing genera a fourteen q fourteen p fourteen will form a small family b fourteen and f fourteen a closely allied family or subfamily and o fourteen i fourteen m fourteen a third family these three families together with the many extinct genera on the several lines of descent diverging from the parent form a will form an order for all will have inherited something in common from their ancient progenitor on the principle of the continued tendency to a divergence of character which was formerly illustrated by this diagram the more recent any form is the more it will generally differ from its ancient progenitor hence we can understand the rule that the most ancient fossils differ most from existing forms we must not however assume that divergence of character is a necessary contingency it depends solely on the descendants from a species being thus enabled to seize on many and different places in the economy of nature therefore it is quite possible as we have seen in the case of some Silurian forms that a species might go on being slightly modified in relation to its slightly altered conditions of life and yet retain throughout a vast period the same general characteristics this is represented in the diagram by the letter f fourteen all the many forms extinct and recent descended from a make as before remarked one order and this order from the continued effects of extinction and divergence of character has become divided into several sub-families and families some of which are supposed to have perished at different periods and some to have endured to the present day by looking at the diagram we can see that if many of the extinct forms supposed to be embedded in the successive formations were discovered at several points low down in the series the three existing families on the uppermost line would be rendered less distinct from each other if for instance the genera a one a five a ten f eight m three m six m nine were disinterred these three families would be so closely linked together that they probably would have to be united into one great family in nearly the same manner as has occurred with ruminants and certain pachyderms yet he who objected to consider as intermediate the extinct genera which thus link together the living genera of three families would be partly justified for they are intermediate not directly but only by a long and circuitous course through many widely different forms if many extinct forms were to be discovered above one of the middle horizontal lines or geological formations for instance above number six but none from beneath this line then only two of the families those on the left hand a fourteen etc and b fourteen etc would have to be united into one 
and there would remain two families which would be less distinct from each other than they were before the discovery of the fossils so again if the three families formed of eight genera a fourteen to m fourteen on the uppermost line be supposed to differ from each other by half a dozen important characters then the families which existed at a period marked six would certainly have differed from each other by a less number of characters for they would at this early stage of descent have diverged in a less degree from their common progenitor thus it comes that ancient and extinct genera are often in a greater or less degree intermediate in character between their modified descendants or between their collateral relations under nature the process will be far more complicated than is presented in the diagram for the groups will have been more numerous they will have endured for extremely unequal lengths of time and will have been modified in various degrees as we possess only the last volume of the geological record and that in a very broken condition we have no right to expect except in rare cases to fill up the wide intervals in the natural system and thus to unite distinct families or orders all that we have a right to expect is that those groups which have within known geological periods undergone much modification should in the older formations make some slight approach to each other so that the older members should differ less from each other in some of their characters than do the existing members of the same groups and this by the concurrent evidence of our best paleontologists is frequently the case thus on the theory of descent with modification the main facts with respect to the mutual affinities of the extinct forms of life to each other and to living forms are explained in a satisfactory manner and they are wholly inexplicable on any other view on this same theory it is evident that the fauna during any one great period in the earth's history will be intermediate in general character between that which preceded and that which succeeded it thus the species which lived at the sixth great stage of descent in the diagram are the modified offspring of those which lived at the fifth stage and are the parents of those which became still more modified at the seventh stage hence they could hardly fail to be nearly intermediate in character between the forms of life above and below we must however allow for the entire extinction of some preceding forms and in any one region for the immigration of new forms from other regions and for a large amount of modification during the long and blank intervals between the successive formations subject to these allowances the fauna of each geological period undoubtedly is intermediate in character between the preceding and succeeding faunas i need give only one instance namely the manner in which the fossils of the devonian system when this system was first discovered were at once recognized by paleontologists as intermediate in character between those of the overlying carboniferous and underlying silurian systems but each fauna is not necessarily exactly intermediate as unequal intervals of time have elapsed between consecutive formations it is no real objection to the truth of the statement that the fauna of each period as a whole is nearly intermediate in character between the preceding and succeeding faunas that certain genera offer exceptions to the rule for instance the species of mastodons and elephants when arranged by dr falconer in two series in the first place according to their mutual affinities and in the second place according to their periods of existence do not accord in arrangement the species extreme in character are not the oldest or the most recent nor are those which are intermediate in character intermediate in age but supposing for an instant in this and other such cases that the record of the first appearance and disappearance of the species was complete which is far from the case we have no reason to believe that forms successively produced necessarily endure for corresponding lengths of time a very ancient form may occasionally have lasted much longer than a form elsewhere subsequently produced especially in the case of terrestrial productions inhabiting separated districts to compare small things with great 
if the principal living and extinct races of the domestic pigeon were arranged in serial affinity this arrangement would not closely accord with the order and time of their production and even less with the order of their disappearance for the parent rock pigeon still lives and many varieties between the rock pigeon and the carrier have become extinct and carriers which are extreme in the important character of length of beak originated earlier than short-beaked tumblers which are at the opposite end of the series in this respect closely connected with the statement that the organic remains from an intermediate formation are in some degree intermediate in character is the fact insisted on by all paleontologists that fossils from two consecutive formations are far more closely related to each other than are the fossils from two remote formations pictet gives as a well-known instance the general resemblance of the organic remains from the several stages of the chalk formation though the species are distinct in each stage this fact alone from its generality seems to have shaken professor pictet in his belief in the immutability of species he who is acquainted with the distribution of existing species over the globe will not attempt to account for the close resemblance of distinct species in closely consecutive formations by the physical conditions of the ancient areas having remained nearly the same let it be remembered that the forms of life at least those inhabiting the sea have changed almost simultaneously throughout the world and therefore under the most different climates and conditions consider the prodigious vicissitudes of climate during the pleistocene period which includes the whole glacial epoch and note how little the specific forms of the inhabitants of the sea have been affected on the theory of descent the full meaning of the fossil remains from closely consecutive formations being closely related let it be remembered that the forms of life at least those inhabiting the sea have changed almost simultaneously throughout the world and therefore under the most different climates and conditions consider the prodigious vicissitudes of climate during the pleistocene period which includes the whole glacial epoch and note how little the specific forms of the inhabitants of the sea have been affected on the theory of descent the full meaning of the fossil remains from closely consecutive formations being closely related though ranked as distinct species is obvious as the accumulation of each formation has often been interrupted and as long blank intervals have intervened between successive formations we ought not to expect to find as i attempted to show in the last chapter in any one or in any two formations all the intermediate varieties between the species which appeared at the commencement and close of these periods but we ought to find after intervals very long as measured by years but only moderately long as measured geologically closely allied forms or as they have been called by some authors representative species and these assuredly we do find we find in short such evidence of the slow and scarcely sensible mutations of specific forms as we have the right to expect on the state of development of ancient compared with living forms we have seen in the fourth chapter that the degree of differentiation and specialization of the parts in organic beings when arrived at maturity is the best standard as yet suggested of their degree of perfection or highness we have also seen that as the specialization of parts is an advantage to each being so natural selection will tend to render the organization of each being more specialized and perfect and in this sense higher not but that it may leave many creatures with simple and unimproved structures fitted for simple conditions of life and in some cases will even degrade or simplify the organization yet leaving such degraded beings better fitted to their new walks of life in another and more general manner new species become superior to their predecessors for they have to beat in the struggle for life all the older forms with which they come into close competition we may therefore conclude that if under a nearly similar climate the eocene inhabitants of the world could be put into competition with the existing inhabitants the former would be beaten and exterminated by the latter as would the secondary by the eocene and the paleozoic 
by the secondary forms. So that by this fundamental test of victory in the battle for life, as well as by the standard of the specialization of organs, modern forms ought, on the theory of natural selection, to stand higher than ancient forms. Is this the case? A large majority of paleontologists would answer in the affirmative, and it seems that this answer must be admitted as true, though difficult to prove. It is no valid objection to this conclusion that certain brachiopods have been but slightly modified from an extremely remote geological epoch, and that certain land and freshwater shells have remained nearly the same from the time when, as far as is known, they first appeared. It is not an insuperable difficulty that foraminifera have not, as insisted on by Dr. Carpenter, progressed in organization since even the Laurentian epoch, for some organisms would have to remain fitted for simple conditions of life, and what could be better fitted for this end than these lowly organized protozoa? Such objections as the above would be fatal to my view, if it included advance in organization as a necessary contingent. They would likewise be fatal if the above foraminifera, for instance, could be proved to have first come into existence during the Laurentian epoch, or the above brachiopods during the Cambrian formation, for in this case there would not have been time sufficient for the development of these organisms up to the standard which they had then reached. When advanced up to any given point, there is no necessity, on the theory of natural selection, for their further continued process, though they will, during each successive age, have to be slightly modified so as to hold their places in relation to slight changes in their conditions. The foregoing objections hinge on the question whether we really know how old the world is, and at what period the various forms of life first appeared, and this may well be disputed. The problem whether organization on the whole has advanced is in many ways excessively intricate. The geological record, at all times imperfect, does not extend far back enough to show, with unmistakable clearness, that within the known history of the world, organization has largely advanced. Even at the present day, looking to members of the same class, naturalists are not unanimous which forms ought to be ranked as highest. Thus, some look at the Silesians, or sharks, from their approach in some important points of structure, to reptiles as the highest fish. Others look at the Teleosteans as the highest. The Ganoids stand intermediate between the Silesians and Teleosteans. The latter at the present day are largely preponderant in number. But formerly Silesians and Ganoids alone existed, and in this case, according to the standard of highness chosen, so will it be said that fishes have advanced or retrograded in organization. To attempt to compare members of distinct types in the scale of highness seems hopeless. Who will decide whether a cuttlefish be higher than a bee, that insect which the great von Baer believed to be, quote, in fact, more highly organized than a fish, although upon another type? End quote. In the complex struggle for life, it is quite credible that crustaceans, not very high in their own class, might beat cephalopods, the highest mollusks, and such crustaceans, though not highly developed, would stand very high in the scale of invertebrate animals, if judged by the most decisive of all trials, the law of battle. Beside these inherent difficulties in deciding which forms are the most advanced in organization, we ought not solely to compare the highest members of a class at any two periods, though undoubtedly this is one, and perhaps the most important element in striking a balance, but we ought to compare all the members, high and low, at two periods. In an ancient epoch, the highest and lowest molluscoidal animals, namely cephalopods and brachiopods, swarmed in numbers. At the present time, both groups are greatly reduced while others, intermediate in organization, have largely increased. Consequently, 
some naturalists maintain that mollusks were formerly more highly developed than at present but a stronger case can be made out on the opposite side by considering the vast reduction of brachiopods and the fact that our existing cephalopods though few in number are more highly organized than their ancient representatives we ought also to compare the relative proportional numbers at any two periods of the high and low classes throughout the world if for instance at the present day fifty thousand kinds of vertebrate animals exist and if we knew that at some former period only ten thousand kinds existed we ought to look at this increase in number in the highest class which implies a great displacement of lower forms as a decided advance in the organization of the world we thus see how hopelessly difficult it is to compare with perfect fairness under such extremely complex relations the standard of organization of the imperfectly known faunas of successive periods we shall appreciate this difficulty more clearly by looking to certain existing faunas and floras from the extraordinary manner in which european productions have recently spread over new zealand and have seized on places which have been previously occupied by the indigenes we must believe that if all the animals and plants of great britain were set free in new zealand a multitude of british forms would be in the course of time become thoroughly naturalized there and would exterminate many of the natives on the other hand from the fact that hardly a single inhabitant of the southern hemisphere has become wild in any part of europe we may well doubt whether if all the productions of new zealand were set free in great britain any considerable number would be enabled to seize on places now occupied by our native plants and animals under this point of view the productions of great britain stand much higher in the scale than those of new zealand yet the most skilful naturalist from an examination of the species of the two countries could not have foreseen this result Agassiz and several other highly competent judges insist that ancient animals resemble to a certain extent the embryos of recent animals belonging to the same classes and that the geological succession of extinct forms is nearly parallel with the embryological development of existing forms this view accords admirably well with our theory in a future chapter i shall attempt to show that the adult differs from its embryo owing to variations having supervened at a not early age and having been inherited at a corresponding age this process whilst it leaves the embryo almost unaltered continually adds in the course of successive generations more and more difference to the adult thus the embryo comes to be left as a sort of picture preserved by nature of the former and less modified condition of the species this view may be true and yet may never be capable of proof seeing for instance that the oldest animals reptiles and fishes strictly belong to their proper classes though some of these old forms are in a slight degree less distinct from each other than are the typical members of the same groups at the present day it would be vain to look for animals having the common embryological nature of the vertebrata until beds rich in fossils are discovered far beneath the lowest cambrian strata a discovery of which the chance is small End of chapter eleven part one